sort of late 70s, uh, this was definitely an eye-opener. So anyway, uh, it was nice to come out here. I still remember a guy in college, and he was an accounting major. And uh, I was a philosophy major, ended up with philosophy and theology. I couldn't imagine anybody who would really want to study accounting. And I said, you know, what do you want to do with that? Obviously, you know, you could be an accountant. He said, I'm an accounting major so that I can go in and help save Catholic health care, you know, because they're struggling and they need good people. And I was actually impressed. I was very healthy. I'd never spent a night in a hospital. I didn't know almost anything about health care. But I was impressed. I thought, well, that, that's pretty neat. You know, little did I realize that years later, I would sort of end up in the healthcare field myself in a funny way uh, and work for the Catholic Medical Association. Uh, another quick historical note, one of the most uh, intriguing and enjoyable afternoons of my life uh, was spent with Gene Diamond back in fall of 2002. I was already working at a Catholic hospital and I was trying to convince the CEO that we, he should have a robust Catholic identity, uh, which they did not have. And I talked back and forth with him for a while, and he finally said, well, you know, can you show me any place it's like this? You know, show me what it looks like. And I had heard of Gene Diamond. I had never met him or talked to him or anything, but I had heard of him. I heard he was a very good guy. So I, I wrote him. And I said, this is what we want to do. We want to come and visit you. And he, um, he opened up an entire afternoon for us. We sat for three or four hours talking. Much of the material in there, he just talked about what he was doing. Uh, the inspiring things, the challenging things, you know, what it took to do that. And, and it was really, really impressive. So he's the gold standard, i got to tell you. Um, you know, he is rarer than diamonds, you know. <laughs> out there. So he's the gold standard. I'm going to try to talk uh, quickly uh, about how to improve, well, applying the ERDs is a thing, but, but essentially to uh, improve in effectively living uh, one's Catholic identity as a hospital. So that's my goal. I, I'm not, uh, I left that world about six years ago, so I, I have not been in the hospital side of things for a while. I spent six years working in a mid-sized Catholic hospital in the Midwest. Uh, it was part of the Trinity Health System that actually Gene referred to. Uh, one of the hospitals he's CEO over uh, came out of the system I worked for called Trinity. Um, but um, anyway, uh, so I was a mid-sized hospital and then part of the fourth largest system in the country. So. I got, a, I got a good look, but it's really hard to go and talk uh, about what people are doing out there and what is best practice. Again, I think you saw it. Uh, so what I'm going to do, though, is talk about strategies and models that can be used and identified based in part on the nature of Catholic healthcare and in part based on existing and respected uh, and significant programs. Uh, some of this I tried to do while I was there, uh, and some of it I um, have thought about since, and, uh, and, and this I think is a valuable way to go. So, the, um, the first key strategy really is to commit to integrity in Catholic identity. St. Thomas Aquinas said, you know, in moral action, the first thing you have to do is will the end. You know, everything follows from that. So. Every Catholic hospital should will, as its end, to have a robust and complete Catholic identity across the board. I mean, and that would go everything from its employee insurance policy right down to the bedside. First, you have to uh, commit to that. Um, Catholic identity shouldn't be equated with what only Catholics believe and no one else. I mean, I, I saw this when I got there. Essentially, People like to talk about what everybody agreed about, compassion, respect, concern for the poor, um, ethics and stewardship. I think those were our values. You know, who could be against compassion, right? <laughs> who can be against, well, we share the value of compassion with compassion and choices for the dying, don't we? I mean, we're all for compassion, right? So we can all talk about things we all agree upon. 
Um, but, you know, obviously that's not good enough. Um, and mission and historical identity really, I think, should be subordinate to Catholic identity. Again, Jean's Hospital is a gold standard. You can see a very strong Franciscan identity. Uh, but in my experience, what many hospitals do is they stress the charism of the sisters who have founded them. And they uphold their founders or maybe a past inspirational physician uh, or, or religious sister leader who has been there. And so they talk about mercy or they talk about Holy Cross. You know, they talk about something, but they don't talk about Christ. Actually, one of my other favorite little anecdotes, we had a, a cultural renewal effort and I got to help renew the culture and, and it went pretty well. But, uh, and I know some of you have been through these exercises where you have to come up with these um, uh, big hairy statements or these big challenging statements, you know, and then you write them all down on, on boards and then you, you shrink them down. And I came up with a statement, you know, that Mercy Medical Center exists to provide healthcare and other services uh, that are faithful to the example and teachings of Jesus Christ. I thought, well, that's, that says a lot, and it's pretty short, you know, and all that stuff. And this one guy, our materials management guy, who had come out from Virginia, said, you can't say that. You know, that's a violation of the separation of church and state. <laughs> I laughed. I said, well, let me, let me assure you, we can say that, okay? Just don't worry. We can say that. And uh, it was really pretty funny. He finally admitted that since we were out in Iowa and across the Missouri, uh, uh, Mississippi River, not quite across the Missouri River, uh, but he finally admitted that, you know, since we were way out there, we could say it. <laughs> then, then, I think if, if you will, this is an end and you don't get lost, then, I think actually a very useful way forward is to commit to the same high standards and tools used in other critical areas of Catholic health care, uh, of health care delivery in general, certainly uh, Catholic health care delivery. I'm going to flip through these slides really quick because I think a lot of you know it and you've had some experience with it. Um, so I'll just flip through real quick. You have the, um, the organizational integrity movement that started out as the corporate compliance programs, um, a lot of government money, uh, fixed federal sentencing guidelines so they could send white collar criminals to jail. But everybody got their attention that you know you got to do the right thing. Uh, it then turned it went from compliance to integrity, uh, expanded. There's a very high level of commitment to this. Um, oops. And, well, now I don't know how to go back. Um, very high level of commitment to this, and there's a very broad scope of areas covered by the integrity uh, movement. The quality improvement movement, anyone in healthcare has probably had a fair uh, experience with that, came out of a couple of things in uh, continuous quality improvement, total, total quality management, and a lot of things went into encouraging uh, quality improvement, just Improving quality of care, avoiding lawsuits, you know, just doing better things better and more efficiently, uh, and so on. And finally, accreditation, uh, which began way back in the 50s and then became, uh, you know, an essential part of the process for Medicare and insurance reimbursement, uh, and it's kind of a proxy for state licensure. And then you get uh, the Joint Commission, as you know, massive organizations with a variety of standards across the spectrum. Uh, in medicine, and it's taken very, very seriously, uh, as anyone in healthcare knows. So, what are some of the tools? I better flip through these really quick. By the organizational integrity, you have policies to define commitments in terms. I'll come back to that. Processes to educate, procedures to monitor and audit, uh, employment policies that define compliance as an essential element of all employment conditions and mechanisms that encourage employees to report violations, to investigate such violations, and to recommend appropriate uh, sanctions and then systems to correct as quickly as possible any deviation, um, any deviation by the use of effective enforcement tools. So you get a lot of stuff there, and, and if you've dealt with, um, if you've dealt with that uh, in healthcare, I know you've seen it. Quality tools range from everything from quality employee you know, fish diagrams and things to think through processes to being able to go through and look at ICD-9 codes and CPT codes and say, how are we doing, you know, in any number of things. And when I was 
um, in meetings of leadership and so on, uh, we would hear about quality efforts that were going on looking at length of stay for Medicare patients with pneumonia. You know, what is the length of stay? Why is the variation? Which doctor is the variation coming from? But they could they could do everything in terms of code. So we started with the you know the treatment code, and then you had uh, practice areas coded. You had individual doctors coded. No one had to mention a name, although it was kind of a small town, uh, and and we knew who's had some of the higher lengths of stay. You know, but but you could do all that anonymously. We looked at uh, in our clinic systems. Uh, you have history and physicals on every time a patient came in. It was a compliance issue, it was a quality of care issue. We could break it down by, by clinic, by physician, with clinics in Iowa and Nebraska, you know, how they were doing in the states and so on. And finally, um, a big part of a, uh, the whole accreditation process, I don't know if, if you all know this, but it's making sure that employees get adequate education. Every employee in a healthcare institution needs an annual review. Part of that annual review is, an, is a refresher of education. And hospitals have developed some pretty complex systems to deliver not only better education than they used to. When, when I showed up, they were still putting it in a paper binder or book and sending the books around by inner office mail. And you would fill in things by pencil and send it back. So then it, it all went online, so you can only provide better education if you can document who did it and who didn't do it, uh, and so on. Okay, so applying the tools. Um, one thing I think we can and should do is cite and build upon policy language. And I have some here, just a couple of examples. Every person employed or represented, and this is from Christus Medical, Christus Medical System, must make every effort to ensure that activities and behaviors flow from the mission and core values and comply with the letter and spirit of all laws, regulations, policies, and procedures. Okay, so that's, um, you know, that's one thing. Another from our own policy, Mercy Medical Center, is committed to complying with all legal, professional, and ethical obligations that apply to its various businesses and to fostering a culture that enables everyone to fulfill their legal, professional, and ethical obligations. Well, are the ethical and religious directives explicitly listed in the organizational integrity policy? That's actually a good question. In my case, the answer was no. When I got there, they weren't listed. And yet, they should be listed not only as an internal standard, but also this standard should be cited. Now again, uh, Gene Diamond, does it and their, their hospital does it as a matter of their culture. It's not a matter of culture for many people. So you have to build it into the very fabric of what they're supposed to be doing and certainly the ethical religious directives fall right into there. And you can utilize other things. I'll give you an example. Um, one thing you have to do when you have an integrity policy is educate all your employees about it and all your physicians about it. So, you know, my system came up with booklets for staff and physicians. And in the first edition of the physician book, when it came to the section on ethics, uh, this is what it said. It said, physicians, nurses, therapists, and other caregivers shall observe all applicable standards of professional practice in providing service. That's all it said. Kind of amazing. So I went up to a lunch. I happened to be at lunch. And the senior vice president for integrity sat at my table. And he said, well, we were wondering, you know, is there anything specifically Catholic we could cite? Or is there anything we could do to improve? You know? And I said, you know, funny you should ask. Um, <laughs> we actually have this thing now the senior vice president for mission and the vice presidents for ethics hadn't actually gotten the memo to him, but I said, you know, there is an authority you could cite. It's called the Ethical and Religious Directives. And he was actually very pleased to hear about that. And so in the second edition of the book, and I think I have a thing here, the second edition of the book, 
down in this paragraph that actually says address ethical conflicts that may arise in patient care, including end of life issues, follow the ethical and religious, religious directives for Catholic health care services, and utilize Trinity House Ethics Committee, et cetera, et cetera. So there it is. And up here, the ethical and religious directives for Catholic health care services is mentioned and defined. A kind of a, a small victory, I mean, it's something that should have happened all along, but it's not something that is in place in every place. And it should be. It should be written right into the fabric. Uh, quality tools are another example. I don't know how many of you remember, going back a few years, 2008 or 9, um, there was actually uh, something came out on WikiLeaks uh, called Catholic Hospital Sterilizations, Contraception, and Abortion Data in Texas Public Use Files. Uh, it was put right out on WikiLeaks. Um, that was before that guy went a little nuts and started to release all the government cables and all of those things. But WikiLeaks, I don't even know if they're still going, but it was a place where you could reduce, really release things anonymously. And what they did is they took from publicly available data um, certain ICD-9 codes for sterilization, contraceptive management, and legal induced abortion, and then the corresponding treatment codes uh, for tubal procedures, vasectomy, and termination of pregnancy, and they showed exactly which of those procedures were taking place in specific Catholic hospitals in Texas. So, you can do that. Just this last summer, uh, someone published a PhD dissertation called Appeals to Conscience Clauses in Face of Divergent Practices Among Catholic Hospitals. So a woman got her PhD at Baylor in the area of church-state relations. And this is available at catholichospitals.org. Pretty easy to remember. Check it out at catholichospitals.org, and that's what her website looks like. And um, that's what a page looks like. It just so happened that it came right up to California at a number of Catholic Health West um, system hospitals. I realize they've had a change of uh, heart or soul lately, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe not. You know. Um, but you could go through their, their hospitals and find, now she focused very specifically uh, not on legal induced abortion, but simply uh, the CPT code uh, V25.2 tubal ligation and, and the variety of ways of interfering uh, with that. Um, but anyway, you, know, you can go right through those things and see. Now, you don't have to wait for publicly available data to know what's going on in your own hospital, and not only with regard to um, you know, tubal ligations and things like that, but even prescriptions for the pill, Depo-Provera shots, I mean, you not, name it. You can know all those things, and you don't have to take uh, anybody's word for it. Um, you don't have to trust. I throw this up real quick. This is actually about 10 years old, came out of the Catholic Health Association, and it's a, um, basically it shows which hospitals were educating their employees on the ethical and religious directives. You notice that most of the things are off to the left. Zero to 10 percent is right here of employees, and you can see out of 127 hospitals who answered the question, 60 of them, more than 60, said that 0 to 10 percent of their employees were being educated on the ERDs. Um, and the physicians, fewer answered the questions, and it was even higher. So I'm going to pull up there and just end it.